so what we can do is before uh, we continue further why don't we take a few audience questions yeah please please i think i think, I think we've got a lot of uh, you know very fervent fans that are out there uh, a lot of them are asking what is the book that you were referring to in your last point right what is the book uh no i was referring to digital minimalism that's the name of the book and uh, okay. the book before that was deep work and both of them are by the same author cal newport and he better pay me a commission when he gets all those orders very nice so uh sail had a question for you from uh, give me one second from a lady called uh, disha jain right and she has a very specific question saying that for college students graduating this year and deciding whether to go for an mba or to explore the digital media space what can be the best skill that they can develop to secure an internship secure an internship uh that yeah. that uh, really depends on what kind of an uh, what kind of interests you have uh, but mm-hmm. i would definitely say that uh, the area of performance marketing and the area of user experience these are two areas that are going to boom big time uh, user experience because uh, like i said as we move towards the world of distraction and technology these distractions are going to be fueled by apps more apps and more apps that are going to populate into our world right and as there's an app boom in this world we need more and more interface designers and experience designers to really understand how is it that you develop apps that are intuitive for people that even your uncle can use or even your grandma can use without a lot of hand holding right and for that uh, the world will require a lot more ux designers so i think learning the basics of user experience uh, basics of design thinking and even performance marketing which means roi driven marketing how to generate uh, roi on the spend you do these are things that are going to go big time right and uh, if at all there's something i think these are the areas that you should look at at acquiring a basic knowledge and certification and if if somebody is interested and i've seen a lot of uh, you know companies talk about that as well even the understanding of human psychology that is coming into every aspect of you know whether it is media or communication or you know whether you're in the ad world and so on right because they, you know what is it what is it that makes one person click on an ad versus just bypass it or uh, you know Correct. what what colors what colors work for you and 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 so on it's it's never ending right right in fact uh, empathy is actually what you're getting at and empathy or should be one of our core values and empathy is the center of design so as design thinking comes to the fore the biggest mm-hmm. uh, aspect about design thinking that a uh, design thinker needs to learn about is how to empathize with the target audience for which any solution is being designed so uh, and design thinking is going to be involved in every every line of business and everywhere uh, every scenario where businesses are trying to develop new ideas and products for their customers they need to get into the mind of the customer and understand how the customer thinks what are the pain points and therefore how can our product come into the life of the customer and to be able to do that i think empathy uh, uh, contextual inquiry understanding how users interact with products and services in their own environments is is a very key exercise so understanding Uh, human behavior psychology etc is extremely critical at this stage very nice so really quickly uh, what does a client experience with the minimalist look like uh, when somebody reaches out to you and says that uh, you know they'd like to work with you how does what is the flow just really really i guess high level overview oh uh, very simple we quickly reach out we try to reach out within 12 hours uh, because we are okay. very client centric i think that's the value that you also have to have harbor in today's uh, aggressive business world we quickly reach okay. out we share credentials uh, have a conversation about their business needs uh, set up a meeting with the decision makers all virtual of mm-hmm. course given the times that mm-hmm. we are in right now and uh, quickly try to make a pitch around uh, how our offering can help grow their business and uh, and from there it's, it's just uh, closing and getting on to the actual work creating the magic very nice um i believe there was a question that someone had asked give me one second uh, how do you work through creative blocks creative blocks when you have yep uh yeah i i, I feel uh, creativity like is a very debated topic creative people like to think that uh, they will get ideas at any time and and i <laughs> used to earlier think that that bullshit then when i mm-hmm. started getting uh, very deeper into this sometimes i used to feel that probably there's uh, actually a time when ideas click through but what i have realized that if you do certain things i think ideas can come to you at any point right uh, so uh, one habit that i have uh, cultivated over time is meditation uh, because i think meditation gives a uh, big flip to your creativity uh, And, and and secondly it's it's about scheduling uh, hours of free brainstorming so i i use up generally a few hour slots in on saturdays and sundays just to brainstorm 
uh, write or think about creative ideas and and the entire habit of training your mind to sort of come uh, go at a certain time slot and actually think all over the board uh, really trains it to think that this is the time when you have to go creative so i think scheduling our so creativity is also a very critical exercise and of course maintaining a diary where you actually write down all the ideas whenever they come to you is very critical so i've seen that okay. with meditation i mean i have seen that i get ideas whenever like i am while i'm running or i'm showering and i just quickly hurry and write them down somewhere so that they don't get missed so as much as it is important to get out of the blocks it is it's important to document your ideas whenever you get them also so that you can build on them absolutely so what what inspires file what is fire inspired by is it is it movies is it music is it uh, meeting people what is it uh i think i, I enjoy music i enjoy meeting people uh, but i get inspired by uh, people who have created big businesses uh, by being on the right side of ethics and morality so people okay. who honestly build built big companies uh, without raising boat loads of funding i, I really uh, really uh, get inspired by those people uh, just to put a footnote over there uh, build profitable businesses uh, because okay. there's a fine line between building a business and uh, building a profitable business so i think i really look up to people who have managed to do that and uh, secondly also a uh, lot of artists a lot of content creators uh, who managed to so authors authors are people who i get really inspired by uh, by how they managed to put so much information out there in such a readable form So yeah, these are the two categories of people that I really just have a lot of inspiration from. Nice. So what what is the uh, some of the music that you're listening to right now, or what is the last movie that you watched that you that you really enjoyed? Uh, the last movie that I watched uh, that I really enjoyed was uh, a Korean movie called uh, Train okay. to Busan. It's actually not the kind of movie that movie that I watched. It's a zombie zombie movie. Yeah. yeah it's a zombie apocalypse movie <laughs> for some reason uh, it had a uh, uh, probably an undertone of uh, the class divide in the society or something like that but i really enjoyed that movie it was a breath of fresh air and uh, the kind of music that i listened to is equally horrifying and scary i listened to <laughs> a lot of uh, death metal and uh, metal core a music which is wow. generally not palatable and will uh, get you a lot of uh, fires thanks to your neighbors So yeah, that's the kind of music that I listen to. Got it. I have uh, Mukil asking, uh, sorry, Manan asking, what are the top two challenges that a startup can face in the first year and a half? Uh, top challenges? Um, sure. Yeah. I, I, there's there's a whole bunch of challenges. I mean, there's uh, there's a never-ending list of the challenges that you might face. Absolutely. I think first thing is uh, uh, depends on whether you're a technology company or a, like like it's a product or a services mm-hmm. company. for services uh, cash flows turn out to be a nightmare not even the first or second year but throughout your life uh, cash flows in india will never uh, cease to be a problem uh, secondly uh, getting around uh, the law and you know really uh, enforcing contracts is a gigantic problem in india uh, unfortunately uh, in our country ease of doing business is way behind the others primarily because uh, a contract doesn't mean anything and everything just comes down to the trust and integrity of the person that you're transacting with so over there you will find a lot of problems where people are changing deals last minute low balling reneging on their promises so that's that's a very big challenge that you're going to face and everyone is going to face no matter when they start the company uh if you are a young founder of course funding and stuff can be a very big challenge on how to raise the funds uh, that are required initially and we started with zero money we ourselves didn't have any money so we had no option but to execute a bootstrap from hell uh, with zero rupees in our pocket uh, but yeah for businesses that need cash that could be a challenge uh, especially if you don't come from a background where you can get support from your parents or something but uh, and let's talk about this a little realistically as well that you want to be an entrepreneur let's say that you've got a great idea that you want to pursue it you know you're probably not going to see any revenues for at least a what a year year and a half right um, what is it that realistically that you can plan how can you raise some amount of money especially if you're straight out of college um, you know would you recommend that people get a job and then save money on the side would you recommend that they get a loan from their parents uh, i mean what's 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 the right. forward here i think uh, one thing that can uh, really help is having a side income uh, which really helps a lot of people who want to uh, start a business um, correct It, it ensures that you have a safety net uh, no matter what uh, even after 2 years 3 years of struggle if a business doesn't work out uh, mm-hmm. you are under ground zero you at least have a may way of making ends meet and making some money and 
so many times the side income itself turns into the main income for so many people right uh, there's this uh, very popular story of slack i think slack was a gaming company or something and their original idea wasn't really working out and they had created the actual chatting product as a communication channel as an internal tool and uh, that that actually turned out to be the main business and today it's a billion dollar company so True. many times uh, that was just an uh, internal product that was not really the founders of slack trying to do a thing on the side but i'm just saying that so many times things on the side actually turn out to be the main thing so uh, people who are young who are just starting out should hedge their bets a little bit uh, of course 95% of the focus 99% of the focus should be on the main business but there should be that a uh, little thing on the side that at least makes ends meet and uh, i mean uh, it, it ensures that if if things go down there's at least something to fall back upon uh, i think there are a lot of avenues that are opening up uh, probably uh, ed tech you know taking online classes or probably uh, blogger revenue or there are many avenues uh, to really uh, make small income on the side that people can rely on at least to sustain and make ends meet correct right. no great answer thank you i have uh, saket asking that since both you and chirag don't come from a corporate background when you select employees or you select let's say business collaborators what skills or attributes do you guys look for uh for uh, for employees we of course uh, look for cultural alignment uh, since mm-hmm. we have had the uh, uh, we are lucky to have had uh, you know some of the corporate leaders that we have worked with help us define our values and vision uh it's it's uh, at least we have something to gauge people on and i think alignment uh, trumps skill sets honestly because if people are not no matter how people, talented people are if they are not aligned with uh, what your vision is and what kind of goals you have they they are not going to uh, work as hard as you want them to so if if people are really uh, aligned to the kind of core values that you bring to the table for example if people know that uh, energy is the value of the company and i have to be mm-hmm. agile i have to run around Uh, if people know that uh, above and beyond uh, customer delivery is a value and no matter what time of the day the customer calls me i have to do it if people don't uh, reflect those behaviors and attitudes uh, they are not going to be a good fit so this is these are the things that we actually look for more than uh, uh, you know the hardcore creative skill set because i think uh, skill sets can be trained but attitudes uh, and personalities cannot be changed i mean it would take a therapist probably to do that and and we are not therapists so yeah. <laughs> so we would rather hire for intent i and i think a lot of uh, you know youngsters out there need to realize that it's it's very important to be able to prove your value to a potential employer or somebody who's giving you an internship as well right um, you know what is it that like you said what is it that you bring to the table and how do you align or offer value to the organization that you're working with right right absolutely along those lines i have simran asking um, sahil what is a ninja hack to impress you to get an internship at the minimalist <laughs> uh, so <laughs> what we uh, very often do is we try to ask people to come up with uh, minimalist content for our own Instagram, and if mm-hmm. uh, we even ha- had a contest uh, on the New Year, uh, okay, uh, people were asked to come up with the minimalist style content. And in fact, we actually offered an internship to a guy because he uh, came up came up with something so nice that we actually posted it on our Instagram. So we just want to see uh, if people can actually think the way minimalist think again that alignment, right? uh skill like the exact finesse and all can be polished the skill set in terms right. of design thinking can be developed later but if the thought process aligns uh, we would definitely uh, always be open to getting a lot of interns and we do keep uh, getting a lot of interns on board it's always fun to have people who bring in a lot of energy and new ideas on the table in fact uh, i had once uh, gone to europe on a road trip and i got mm-hmm. met an indian guy on the bus and i realized that this guy was also very inclined towards creativity and he was also an engineer and we just got chatting and two weeks later when i came back he had actually applied for an internship and i got him on board so there are these oh, cool. really magical stories also because we are very open to collaborating with interns and young people who bring uh, energy and a lot of uh, fresh ideas to the table so everybody should keep a, a, a watchful eye out for you in the streets of bombay if they come <laughs> to you they, they they need to figure out a way to impress you and get an internship basically that's the answer uh, always open always open <laughs> uh preeta is asking how do you de-stress what do you do in your downtime apart from death metal and <laughs> reading books i uh, when the lockdown wasn't there i used to love going for drumming i am a drummer also mm-hmm. um, okay so so i used to do that on saturdays i i really used to i was getting into swimming a lot i used to swim a lot uh, and right before the lockdown i had almost developed that as a regular habit uh, but i i i swear when this all ends i'm going to go back and get into swimming 
uh, I also enjoy running. Uh, okay. Something that I do. Uh, and, and running and swimming because uh, I am I'm away from the gym right now. I was here, I used to go to the gym also. Uh, and reading, I think I spend most of my time reading and writing. Those are the two primary loves of my life. I, I, either I am reading or I am writing something, uh, mostly trying to make it sound hilarious all the time. So it's a lot of time goes into writing and reading. Yeah. Do you, do you write for yourself or do you write for, uh, like you said, I mean, you need to be empathetic to your audience as well. Right. Uh, so I, for myself, I of course journal every day. Uh, okay. That's what I do for myself. That's a very private thing. And uh, for everyone else, I try to see how you can use my stupid ideas to make people laugh every day. So I keep writing stuff. And I think a lot of people have seen that on LinkedIn. So I, I keep okay. putting out things out there just to put a smile on everyone's face. Nice. Um, so I think this is a question for the ages, uh, Sahil. Ushmi is asking, do you think a formal degree like an MBA is a necessity for succeeding while you're managing your own business? Or do you think that practical experience of working uh, gets efforts and is going to teach you more? Uh, is that question oriented uh, from starting a business point of view or just general success in the corporate world? So I believe she's saying uh, from starting a business point of view. Okay, okay. I think... Uh... Uh, from a business point of view, I probably uh, like I, I don't have a very certain answer to that. I mean, and I, and mm-hmm. people see where people are very quick to jump on uh, the bandwagon and criticize MBAs for whatever they are doing, right? I mean, everyone gets criticized for going for an MBA. So uh, I don't I don't believe in that. I think a lot of successful careers have been built on the backs of successful MBAs also. Uh, especially I think last year, basis of study, I think MBA in marketing was one of the most hottest. Uh, fields and for candidates from that background were in great demand, right? So if you want to build a career in, in that field, I think an MBA is a very good choice. But if you want to start up, I, I really don't think it's necessary. Uh, in fact, starting up itself is a is a very short short MBA and it teaches you a lot of things. Now, I don't know what you get taught in an MBA class, but I'm pretty sure that uh, actually uh, starting up in, equips you with a lot of first-hand learnings that uh, an MBA can probably never do. Uh, because you get your hands dirty and that's the kind of experience that you need uh, for starting up. So even if your startup fails, I think the entire idea of getting your hands dirty and understanding what are the bad things that you need to negotiate with, uh, uh, how do you go about those are the kind of things that you learn when you start up. So it's definitely a crash course and a quick MBA. I think. So we have another question from Disha as well. That uh, and She talks about an MBA program in marketing from an IIM or an ISB. Uh, how important is knowing how to sell when you're starting your career? Oh, right. Uh, I think that is the most critical thing. I, I keep saying that that life is sales. And nobody teaches you that, right? I yes. Mean, yes. Uh, even an MBA, you probably don't have that experience of, you know, Absolutely. selling me this pen. <laughs> exactly. So I think uh, I, this is a very uh, nice question that uh, uh, this person has brought up. So I think... Uh, Disha. Disha, yeah. Uh, so... Yep. Uh, sales is life and life is sales. That's a philosophy that I go by. And in fact, if you were to ask me one thing that I have to tell everyone to be mindful of, no matter whether they want to start a business or succeed in the corporate career, I think it's to learn how to sell. And uh, nobody teaches you, like you said, uh, nobody uh, tells you the keys to influence and uh, what could be better than yet another book, yet another masterpiece to teach you the case to success in selling. So I think there's one book that I would recommend to everyone, which is uh, Influence by Robert C. Aldini. Okay. Uh, Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. That's the name of the book. I think it's a must read for everyone, even if you're not going to go for a career in sales or business. Uh, I think everyone should know how to sell themselves. And in fact, so more often than not in business and in services, you see that people without uh, a key differentiator, or like exceptional quality are also in business, probably just because they're able to sell. So, so knowing how to sell is critical in running a business or succeeding in your career. Uh, someone has asked about journaling. Uh, they've asked that uh, since I mentioned that journaling is helpful, how do I uh, go about journaling and what do I really write? So I think this is a good question because, uh, uh, you know, journaling can be a very difficult task, especially on a day-to-day basis. Um, so what I end up doing is, of course, one is talking about how my day was and some of the thoughts that I felt during the day. I reflect on the day, uh, but more than all of these, uh, you know, day-to-day operational thoughts, what I really reflect on is probably some of the new learnings, some of the new perspectives that I developed. Since I read every day and I read a, a good deal, I think 
from that reading also what are the new thoughts that i have developed uh, even the activities of isolation probably running or probably just sitting idle and sitting with your thoughts i think they induce a lot of thoughts in your mind and just really writing about them uh, gives you a lot of clarity and one of the best thing that i have noticed about journaling is that all you have to do is just start writing right when you write and start documenting your experiences you get more and more thought and that's the beauty of isolation because when you're sitting and documenting your thoughts you get more thoughts and you just uh, beautifully build upon them and that leads to an entire uh, uh, philosophy of thoughts and, and that's something that you can never just think about it, it you actually actually have to sit down the right and you have to experience that flow in order to make the most of it so i would say uh, probably start by writing about your day uh, about your reflections what even new things you learned how that made you feel and as you write you will discover a lot more ideas and it will just uh, go with the flow uh, another question that uh, someone has asked is uh, is it possible to switch from um, hardcore sales background to marketing and if yes what is the skill set required to do so so i think uh, uh, it is uh, definitely possible uh, i think marketing is also a very broad field and what people definitely look for uh, in marketers is uh, the ability to understand customers and the ability to sell Uh, the entire world is trans- transitioning to digital marketing right and uh, there also uh, what wins is the idea of persuasive messages how how do you get people to click on that uh, cta button so i think uh, uh, people from sales background can definitely transition into marketing if they understand the basics of what new age marketing is all about which i also mentioned uh, a while back uh, some of the key skills that you need to understand is probably design thinking uh, probably the medium uh, the media uh, vehicles by which companies are marketing understand some of the case studies and really get a very good sense of user experience because user experience is going to be paramount in tomorrow's world and uh, therefore i think if you understand some of these skills across user experience traditional marketing psychology and uh, you know roi driven marketing performance marketing then you are actually a uh, geared up uh, to begin a career in marketing uh, another question that uh, we have over here is uh, how to approach big clients when you are having very few case studies uh, so i think uh, this is also a very interesting question because it's not easy to get uh, clients right off the bat talking about the fact that it was just for us it was just one thing after the other uh, we were posting a lot of content people loved that we got a few startups initially so initially we didn't land uh, a coca cola or an hdfc bank or an airtel it, it took us time to build some of the startup case studies when we did that probably a few corporates approached us were more open to giving a chance to youngsters that's how we got a few corporates on the board and then gradually when other corporates uh, we were approaching other corporates we had to show them these other case studies uh, from other corporates or show them case studies within their sector and you know what you will be surprised to know that uh, for example when we work with the largest insurance companies in india today what they really want to see is which are the insurance tech startups that we have worked with because corporates are increasingly realizing that uh, startups uh, are the are the uh, front runners in terms of technology and innovation so if someone has worked with them uh, they really understand uh, how how technology works how the new age ways of uh, product design and marketing work and therefore i think working with startups also has its own uh, definitive value so that's how we went about it and i think it's all about taking small bites uh, till you till you get to the get to the bigger pie we had a question as well about self doubt sahil uh, yes. i'm sure uh, you know starting out both you and chirag probably had uh, moments and i don't know if you still do or not but how do you deal with that uh self doubt i think uh, for me uh, it has gone down over time of course there are moments mm-hmm. uh, where you sometimes question yourself but uh, i think it's just about forgetting that and moving on uh, it's as simple as that for me i think uh, one thing that i've realized is that wallowing in self pity is not really a, a productive task it's, at, at the end of the day it's not going to generate anything in fact uh, pity uh, pitying yourself is also very reactive behavior because you think you deserve something and in that moment you think you deserve sympathy but as humans we actually don't deserve anything uh, and, and 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 the entire idea behind whatever we do is to produce as much output as possible so when you are just sitting out there pitying yourself uh, what good is going to come out of it Yeah, maybe you're just licking your psychological wounds, but at the end of the day, that's not really going to help you go back to work tomorrow or do something better. So in a sense, it just turns out to be counterproductive because uh, you realize that whenever something bad happens, you can always have this pity party and feel better about yourself. So I, I feel that uh, the best way to solve a problem is to solve it. 
right? And, and not just think about it for the long hours or uh, blame others or blame yourself or feel inadequate. So I, I try to see what better could have been done. Uh, what learning can I have? Can I look at other data from the past uh, to understand why? Is this a repetitive mistake that I'm making? Uh, so I, I try to be a little analytical when it comes to this and that's, that's what uh, really helps me reduce periods of downtime. And of course, like I said, meditation always helps. Meditation and reflection really helps a lot. So that, that's what I would have to say on this. Very nice. Uh, I have Tanvi asking a financial question. How do you manage finances when you're starting out? Did you approach investors or was it all personal funding? I believe it is all bootstrap. Right. Uh, so for in our case, it was completely bootstrap to the extent that we ourselves didn't put a dime in the company because we didn't have okay. anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we were students, okay. we were absolute beggars in college. Uh, so so I, for us, it was a bootstrap from hell. Uh, but uh, it depends on the business uh, and services. Uh, for example, in the creative field, barrier to entry is actually very low. Uh, to, to give a very simple example, barrier to entry is the highest in an airline business, uh, airline manufacturing business, because the R&D required to manufacture airlines is so high that probably just two companies in the world are doing it, right? So that's how you look at a business and understand barriers to entry. What are the regulatory approvals that you need? What is the kind of government intervention that is happening? Or what is the kind of R&D investment that is required? Uh, what are the skill sets that are absolutely mandatory? For example, any research uh, in, in genomics, for example, requires huge amounts of R&D. So, so businesses can be classified by the amount of uh, upfront investment that they would need and barriers to entry. So barriers, the higher the barrier to entry, the more the upfront investment expertise, technological and human capital uh, would be needed. So I think that's the way to clarify, which is why most technology startups try to raise money, uh, but it is not always necessary to raise money. You can always go down the bootstrap route as well. So uh, the golden rule for running a business is, of course, trying to be bootstrapped for as long as possible. Uh, because so far as you are the controller of the company, you are the owner of the company, you can take decisions freely without being trampled by an investor who bought out some equity on the cheap. So, uh, so it's always prudent to stay bootstrapped for as long as possible. But if your business is such that it requires heavy capital investment, first think about whether you want to do the business and second, then go for raising the funding if you really feel it's worth it. Got it. Um, so you know you arrived when people are asking you for recommendations for your competition aside. I have uh, Morari asking, if the minimalist is out of our reach for branding, what other options do I have for brand building? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, it, it depends on the stage of the company. In fact, one thing that I tell a lot of uh, first time founders, not first time, rather new founders who are just starting out their business, is that uh, probably don't invest a lot in all of that right now. Uh, when you are really strapped uh, for cash and uh, you just want to make your first beta work or launch your first version, I think the most prudent thing to do is probably not invest anything at all. Probably get some contact to, from your circle to do it for free, which is where networking also is very, very critical. So get someone to do it for nothing or probably uh, for, for a very nominal cost so that at least you can get the, put the product out there and test it out or put the service out there and see if someone really needs it. And once you have done this exercise of rapid prototype and you established a need for your uh, idea or business is when you should then probably see how to monetize it. And when revenue and free cash flow begins is only when you start thinking about whether you need to invest more in branding or marketing or UX or whatever it is. So try and let the product or the service speak for itself, typically as long as possible. Yes, let it demonstrate that uh, it is viable and there is a need. Got it. Uh, I have Devasis asking, how do you handle the negotiation ne negotiation part with Indian clients? Uh, as a free service is also very expensive for them. Indians <laughs> love to negotiate. Yes, uh, Indians love to haggle. Uh, doesn't matter if it's Dhania or your service, people are going to beat you down. <laughs> so uh, I think in India, so there are a lot of good, uh, there's a good, lot of good uh, material on negotiation also. Just unfortunately, it falls flat in India. Uh, because whatever you quote, whatever tactics you apply at the end of the day, uh, procurement managers are going to eat you down. So, but but uh, that said, I think uh, it's very important to learn uh, uh, some of the important things on how to run negotiations, how to have the upper hand, how to create a need. That's uh, that's so, so critical that the client has no option but to come to you. Uh, so there's a there's a good book on this as well. It's called Never Split the Difference. Uh, that that was something that I had read a while back. It talks about. Uh, some of the deeper aspects of negotiation 
uh, from an empathy standpoint from understanding the psychology and try to get to a yes from a no so so and it's a trick that uh, can be used in everyday life while probably negotiating with your family with your wife uh, with your boss it, it's it's for everyone so i think uh, probably that book would be a very enriching read if you want to really understand how negotiation work absolutely i've read it and it's a, it's a great book i believe it's actually written by a fbi hostel FBI, negotiator yeah. hostel yeah. negotiator no better person to write a book on negotiation i know can you imagine <laughs> negotiating under, under duress yes um so shar asked a great question especially when it comes to creative and when it comes to service uh, the service industry uh, how do you put a price on the work that you do oh, uh, uh, especially especially the intangibles that are out like you said initially you and shirag had no right. no idea how do you price your work so, so uh, actually this would have been a good question if we would also have asked it to ourselves back then because she didn't <laughs> <laughs> and we just went and rendered whatever the hell <laughs> came to our mind uh but yeah right now the best way to do it since we have a large team of almost 100 people uh, and what mm-hmm. we are doing right now as we speak is implementing time sheets and getting uh, time logs from each individual so we know project by project profitability so if we know the cost to the company basis the man hours uh, will be very it will be very easy to understand what is the total cost of a typical assignment and when you look crunch that data uh, again and again for a typical kind of project then you realize what is the true cost of such a project and then you can develop your pricing it's not a not an easy thing to do in the creative field people don't like uh, logging time but i think uh, this this entire work from home situation has forced us to uh, sort of get into that uh, work ethic and and that's the technique that we'll be using uh, to to create a pricing strategy uh, so talking about work from home how do you think work from home is going to impact the future of work are you because i'm already talking to a lot of clients and customers that are saying we are probably going to reduce a lot of our uh, office space right uh, because we've seen that listen it is possible to have employees be productive even when they're working from home right what are what are your thoughts i mean and what are your experiences over the past month now yeah so i think much to all of our landlords disgust i think we are all going to move out of our spaces because work from home is a very viable opportunity in fact even we are uh, aggressively thinking about how to transition into this model uh, because mm-hmm. it definitely brings down a lot of the cost uh, of course we will probably have a space Uh, there is nothing uh, final uh, from our side on this decision but we are just evaluating a lot of options but i think a lot of companies will also take that call and uh, dramatically increase uh, remote work uh, gone are the days when uh, work from home uh, would be looked down upon like just the way we look down upon a pregnancy before marriage or things like that uh, i mean it will stop becoming a pain and people would be very open uh, to people uh, working from home working remotely uh, so i think uh, we will definitely try to transition uh, into a into a situation where there is some office involvement but it's only when it's really needed right probably for client meetings or probably for inter- larger meetings internally which are very critical and to be done in person but i think uh, remote working is here to stay very nice uh, i have mayank asking you uh, what inspired you not to take a job after iit and start your own business uh it was more of an accident honestly uh of course one of the biggest things that inspired me was that no one was going to give me a job so i had two options uh, one was either uh, sit at home and hear the neighbor aunties bitching about me going to iit and not getting a job or the second was to uh move my ass up and try to do um, something on my own which i ended up doing so so when we saw that of course uh, the only viable alternative was to use what one the one thing that we could do well which was creativity and turn it into a business and and that's where we put our work our minds on and thankfully it turned into a business so so we, i would say we are very lucky also in that regard but yes i mean that's what inspired me to be very honest very nice so and uh, last couple of questions before i let you go sail i'm sure you've got a couple of things lined up for the evening sure. as well uh, let's talk about legacy i know it's a little early because you're probably just starting out uh, <laughs> but what is it that you want to be remembered for what is it that you want to be known for um you know what do you, what is it that you want the minimalist to stand for uh, uh yeah i mean there are two things here what do i i want myself to be remembered for and what should the minimalist be remembered for i think the minimalist of course uh, as one of the organizations that was truly that truly stood out in the entire world of creativity the organization okay. whose approach was always orthogonal was all, they they were, they were the uh, mad freaks who always did things differently and they managed to do it for the largest brands in the world consistently year over year so that's that's the kind of vision that we have to be known globally as thought leaders in the world of creativity and design 
and technology. And as a person, I just want to be remembered as this really stupid and funny guy who also sometimes made sense. <laughs> nice. Um, mistakes that first-time founders should learn from you. Uh, what, not, yeah. what not to do? I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, one thing would be to keep the burn rate extremely low. Uh, if, if, if it's a service-based company which doesn't require upfront investment, not going for funding, I mean, it's very easy to get trapped uh, and go into the layer of raising funds uh, because it's very cool uh, and, and, and sort of destroy the company before it even starts because you have a bunch of investors whose vision is not aligned and you got them on board because just because you needed some cash, right? And uh, as it turns out, you actually don't even need that much cash to run a business uh, initially. So, so that is one. But most importantly, I think uh, the biggest mistake that people do is starting out, uh, starting their companies when they actually don't want to start up, right? So many people think uh, it, it's they will miss out if they don't start a company, uh, and and I would really question that philosophy because I feel it's perfectly fine to be in a job. It's perfectly fine to not start a company uh, since there's so much digital media again all around us. We are always bombarded with PR stories and articles, and you know everyone on LinkedIn seems to be uh, the co-founder of a billion-dollar company today. So, so it just can goad us into thinking that everyone is achieving, whereas I am not. Uh, but that's not the point. I think uh, if you are in it to make money, I think corporate jobs can make you enough and more money. Uh, so, so if you are entering a business, it should be for a larger purpose because when you start a business, you are signing up for all the bad shit. You are not signing up for the money or the awards or the recognition or the fame. I mean, those are going to be those uh, outlier moments. Uh, like in five years, probably once or twice or thrice, you'll get those highs right but what you're really signing up is for the remaining thousand days of uh, constant lows constant struggle constant self-doubt so if you if you really have a larger vision have a larger philosophy behind why you're starting up uh, because of which you're completely ready to go through the struggle uh, no matter how long it takes then you should start up uh, till that time you may even consider uh, being in a job and being happy where you are i mean it's important to align your personal goals first uh, than just jumping on the startup bandwagon because at the end of the day, it's not really a cool thing. It's just a very tough job and more often than not a very thankless job also. Absolutely. And what are what are your thoughts on motivation file? I mean, where do you, where do you get your motivation from? What do you expect from your team members? Uh, do you motivate them? Do they motivate you? Uh, what? How does that work? Yeah, I think uh, I get my motivation from the fact that uh, if, if we are endowed with such a nice uh, vision and if we have such a good differentiator going on for us, then it just makes sense for us to swing for the fences and take the company to a level where we aspire it to be, which is at a global stage. So going global is one of the big things that is on our vision. We have worked with a lot of international clients, but uh, I think we really need to increase that and actually establish ourselves as a company that works with the top brands globally. Uh, probably even set up physical presence in some of the countries. At least that's what we used to think till this entire work from home thing came into the picture. So probably uh, a remote presence at least uh, in a lot of the emerging geographies or rather the evolved geographies and work with global brands increasingly. Uh, what keeps me motivated is the fact that there's a long way to go and probably have barely scratched the surface right now. And, and I think uh, very, I'm very thankful uh, to be in this position where I can constantly learn and grow so I think it's a constant endeavor to be a better version of myself that honestly keeps me motivated. And since I'm creatively engaged, meaningfully engaged in business, I think I couldn't have asked for more. So I think that's just something that keeps me motivated. Great. And one final question for you, Sahil, is what is the favorite piece of uh, work or art or project that you've worked on or that you and Chirag have worked on together? Right. Uh, I think uh, there are many. Actually, this is a very difficult question. Uh, there's a lot of work. <laughs> For example, uh, we work with HDFC Bank, which is the country's largest bank, to do a lot of lot of very cool work on their social media. Uh, we manage a lot of uh, the amazing content that they put out. And, and in fact, it's, it's wonderful to know that since they love what the minimalist does, they wanted us to do it for HDFC Bank also. So I am very proud of the work that we do there. I'm very proud of the work that we are doing for Tata AIG. Uh, we are launching their new customer portal for buying insurance. So some, there's some very cool work out there. But, but I mean, these are regular projects. Some of the things that I've been really proud of, uh, which is off late, is uh, an effort that our team uh, pulled off very recently. Uh, so so there's, a comp there's a Fortune 500 company called St. Gobain. And uh, mm -hmm. we, our team created a nine-minute video 
for that brand uh, in a matter of three days. That's almost like a short wow. film that we pulled out. Uh, three, four people didn't sleep over the weekend for three days to pull that out. And that was for a larger purpose because that video was being used by the Tamil Nadu government for spreading information on how companies in the state could come out of the lockdown and what are the uh, things that, uh, precautions that they should keep in mind. So this uh, video was a mad effort by our team, uh, which is being played by the Tamil Nadu government now for all the largest businesses. So I, I am really proud of the work that our team does, uh, putting their personal interests aside just for the sake of delivering uh, customer delight, for the sake of a larger cause over here, actually. So, so I'm very, very proud of the kind of work that these guys are doing. Great. So, Zail, I think uh, you're, a, you're a great role model for somebody who is doing things differently, who follows his passion. Um, and, you know, like the old saying goes that if you're passionate about something, it's not really work. Right. Um, so, on behalf of the CEO's chair, I just wanted to wish you a ton more success. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, and please stay connected. And uh, just, you know, to all the listeners and the viewers out there, we have a ton of people that were out there. Uh, so, we we'll make sure that the recording gets to everyone. And if there's any other questions that they want to ask, feel free to route the questions to us. So, Sahil, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Sahil. See Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, stay connected with us on social media. And look forward to the next episode of the CEO's Chair. All the best to everyone.